record this thing. Welcome to Art 244. We are now recording on my computer. So um, yes, we are. And so now I'm going to go to share screen and <clears throat> do this thing. So I have all of you guys um, on my participants list here, and maybe I need to just make it much smaller and push you guys up out of the way. Sorry about that. Turn on this PowerPoint presentation and talk a little bit about figure sculpture. Now I'm looking at art history from the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance for the most part. And then what comes directly after the Renaissance, the Baroque period. So we're talking about 15th century um, Southern Europe, Italy for the most part. Then 16th to 17th century uh, Italy. Again, that's the Baroque period. And then we're going to look at um, the 19th and early 20th century, mostly through the eyes of one sculptor because he's my favorite. And he is an interesting figure in terms of what he does pivotally from traditional art into the modern age. And so without any further ado, we're going to go to the early part, the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. Um, the last half of the 15th century in Italy, this is the beginning of the Italian Renaissance, not the high Renaissance. And so Donatello is one of our uh, favorite uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he was a sculptor um, sculpting in, uh, in Italy in the mid 1400s, as you can see. And this was um, the first major unsupported uh, bronze casting um, pretty much since, the, um, since antiquity. And this is, this is a sculpture of David. Um, the boy who would become king, this David uh, from biblical texts, um, had the um, audacity to uh, have to go into combat against the giant Goliath. And so this is the David that slew Goliath. And so in this depiction of David, we see the sweet young boy, probably, I don't know, 12 or 13. He's puberty, you know, he's young boy, he's got long hair and a cute little hat, actually. Um, he's got a great big sword that he's holding on to, and that's not really his sword as we get into the, um, into the story of David and Goliath. And he's standing very easily in a wonderful contrapposto pose over the severed head of Goliath. So he, you can actually see in the upraised foot, underneath the upraised foot, that that's a head down there with a battle helmet on top of it. And that's the head of Goliath that he's standing on. So this, is, this has been a fascinating piece for art historians to look at because David is so youthful and so androgynous in the way that he stands that, you know, he's not really male and he's not really female. He's kind of a little bit of both. We've got the wonderful S curve running through his torso and that S curve, that contrapposto movement of forms is because he's got all of his weight on his right foot. It's our left in the photograph, but it's his right foot. And he has no weight on his left foot because the left foot, the left foot is raised and perhaps he's got just a little bit of weight on the face on the cheek of Goliath that he's got that foot resting on. Um, this, this is a very um, sensual piece. It's so interesting in its sensuality um, because um, one of the things that many art historians have been interested in is this back view of David. The back is almost as interesting, if not more interesting than the front in terms of the musculature and the um, anatomy of uh, David's back with the scapula and the process of the spine running through the middle of the back and uh, the glutes and everything. But when we look down at the helmet and head, the severed head of Goliath, we also see this, this kind of this wing element that kind of emanates off of the helmet and that kind of comes up caressing the inner thigh of David. 
And so, you know, this is just fraught with all kinds of dangerous interpretations that I don't want to go into, but it's an interesting way of interacting the vanquished uh, giant Goliath with the youthful uh, David as the, um, the, the champion of this fight that, they two, that the two of them fought. Um, in David's hand over here, the bent hand, we see the rock in his hand because David's weapon, if you'll remember your biblical text, because everybody has taken, you know, you know, good Bible study, um, was the sling, the sling, not the slingshot necessarily, but a sling that would be some kind of a rope or um, fabric long piece of, of material in which a rock was placed and you could you could swing this thing over your head or to the side and then launch a rock much further than a person can throw a rock. And so David, as the young shepherd boy who knew the sling because uh, shepherding sheep, he used a sling as a weapon to keep the wolves and coyotes and whatever the equivalent is in the Middle East away from his uh, uh, herds and then used that in battle with Goliath. So um, the, the texture of this sculpture is very, very smooth. And um, uh, you know, again, it really, um, uh, the smooth and polished bronze really shows a very extremely youthful um, texture uh, to the skin and barely any muscle tone. I mean, we're really dealing with a uh, kind of a, a pubescent boy here. Um, uh, being depicted. Okay, moving along to Michelangelo's David, you're going to sense a little bit of a theme here. Um, but this is really fun in art history to look at how these various sculptors have dealt with the theme of David and Goliath. Because um, um, David was a really important figure, especially to the city of Florence, where Michelangelo was doing this um, second commission. This is only uh, Michelangelo's second major piece that he did in his career. Um, Michelangelo was about 24 or 25 years old when he carved this sculpture, this masterpiece, um, David. So that, that little fact all by itself has always um, made every art major in the classroom cringe because it's like, oh, you know, how could I even compete with such genius, with such mastery and all of that? And the truth is we can't compete with Michelangelo. We have to, you know, find our own path. We have to find our own vision um, in sculpture and in art. So don't worry about trying to compete with David. I mean, with Michelangelo. So let's look at this one. This stone carving was done for um, the uh, cathedral in Florence. And the cathedral in Florence had been under construction for a couple of hundred years, just like most large scale cathedral projects in Europe. And they were looking for commissions uh, of the prophets to put along the edge of the roof line and the roof of this cathedral is, you know, 150 feet off the ground. So it would be way up, up um, overhead and kind of difficult to see. So it is um, thought that by a lot of um, art historians that some of the, um, some of the things that um, Michelangelo emphasized in this David was because it was going to be viewed from down on the ground and it was going to be 150 feet overhead, rather difficult to see. This piece is 17 feet tall. This is a 17 foot tall single piece of marble that um, Michelangelo sculpted for this. It was received so well by the town that they didn't, they decided to not put it up on the parapets on the edge of the roof line of the cathedral, but they had it installed in the plaza in one of the main piazzas um, in uh, Florence so that people could see it down at ground level as a masterpiece sculpture that it was. Looking at Michelangelo's approach to the human figure, to the nude male figure, it's really interesting because again, the story of David is that he's a boy, that he's a shepherd boy, and he's the only one who stepped forward to um, challenge the champion Goliath um, when the two armies were in battle and they wanted to have just a battle of 
you know, two champions to try to uh, end the war that they were fighting. So um, this young boy steps forward. Well, this one is not quite a young boy anymore. We have an adult male um, in his full um, uh, physical uh, strength. This is a late teenage to early 20s um, year old male. Although the head and hands are just a little bit enlarged so that it still has that little bit of tension of um, the awkwardness of puberty or adolescence. So the head is a little bit bigger than it should be for this body and the hands and to a lesser extent, the feet are just a little bit bigger than they should be to try to, to um, put together the idea of this, um, the strength and masculinity of this, you know, um, what's supposed to be uh, an, uh, an adolescent um, with, the, with the coming strength of um, the person who's going to become the king uh, of the Hebrews at, at some point, King David, you know, when he reaches his full maturity. But right now he's David the boy. What's really interesting to a lot of us, and I'm gonna move forward with this, are some of the details of the sculpture. Um, the sculpture is animated by this turn, and I got to go back to the full size view. Again, we have this contrapposto uh, use of weight all on one foot here. When you put the weight of the figure standing on one foot, it slightly raises this hip and it slightly lowers the other hip. So the plane of this hip is at an angle that goes upwards to the left. What that does to balance out the figure is that the shoulders go in the opposite direction. So this shoulder on the left is lower while the shoulder on the right is higher. And so we've got an, another plane going at this angle. These two angles are kind of running against each other. And that's the word contrapposto, which is Italian for against the pose where it comes from. Now you can have a twist in this pose or not necessarily have a twist in, in a contrapposto pose, but mostly we're talking about putting all of the weight on one foot uh, and then um, having this differentiation of the planes of the hips versus the plane um, or whatever the, the line, the, the central um, horizontal axis running through the shoulders would be. Now his head is turned and of course a turned head will make the sternocleidomastoid muscle stick out in the neck. And so we get this beautiful sternomastoid muscle in the neck of David as he's turning his head. And what's really interesting in this sculpture is where we are at in the combat of the story. I'm gonna run back to Donatello. This is after he's already killed Goliath and he's standing, um, in victory over the top of Goliath's head that he has severed with Goliath's sword. So he took the dead Goliath's sword after he hit Goliath in the head with the stone from the sling, and he took Goliath's head sword then and severed his head. Okay, this is before the combat. So this is right when um, um, David is turning to face Goliath. And so it's a really interesting moment because there's all kinds of muscular tension that is in the sculpture, both in the front of the sculpture and in the back of the sculpture. And this back view is really interesting because being held in this upraised hand here is the leather or fabric sling. And here on the back is the sling very close to the body of David. Again, the sensuality is in incredible because it just, it kind of caresses his body as it comes down past the hip and lands in this hand over here. And in this resting hand down here is the stone that is already nestled in the sling. So we have a combatant who's ready and poised for battle. And so when we look at some of these details here, we see the upraised hand with the one end of the sling in this hand, David turning to look at with an intense gaze at uh, Goliath, who he's gonna go into battle with. You can see his, his brows are furrowed and there's a look of kind of anxiety and some worry on his face, but not too much. There's also the calm and grace of him knowing that God is with him and that he's going to be victorious in this battle. And this, this again, this sternal class, sternal 
mastoid muscle sticking out of the neck right here is just incredible. The tousled hair of Goliath as a youth, um, this is very much in keeping with the tradition of tousled hair to depict a boy or um, an adolescent male. Let's look over here at the detail of the hand. This is the hand that's down by the hip that conceals or nestles the stone that's part of the sling. The sling comes down the back of the hip and comes around the hip. And then the stone is in the, in the palm of the hand. The stone then also helps to connect the hand um, to the, the hip of the sculpture so that the hand um, has enough connection in, uh, of stone of um, what would you call it? Mechanical connection so that the, the arm would not break off. Um, it's, a, it's a genius way of, of combining the elements of the sculptural and biblical story together so that technically um, the sculpture is not, um, so it, that sculpture is durable so that it could be hoisted with a crane all the way up to the top of the, um, the cathedral that it was intended for, but also, you know, so that it would definitely wouldn't break off. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous, fantastic uh, sculpture. Um, Michelangelo's first major commission when he was about 20 years old was the Pietà. It was done around 1499 and Pietà is Italian for the piety, which means a deep sense of faith um, and grace. Um, and this is, of course, from, you know, it's a biblical reference to the death of Jesus. And we've got his mother, Mary, here um, after Jesus's body has been taken down from the crucifixion and his body is laying uh, lifeless in Mary's lap. Um, you know, art historians and critics have looked at this sculpture forever and just marveled at it. Um, it's done in marble, of course. Um, Mary looks um, super sized because, you know, she's got an adult child. Her adult child, Jesus, is laying in her lap, and he's a 30-year-old man, and she is depicted with a super, super youthful face, and that's always been thought to be a convention um, of um, because, you know, she's, you know, Mary, mother of God, uh, that kind of thing, that uh, she never ages, that, um, you know, she has this kind of eternal youthful beauty and grace. And so she's, she seems almost more youthful than her 30-year-old son, whose dead body is draped in her lap. Um, her hand, one hand is supporting him underneath his armpit, and the other hand is open in this open gesture of grace. Um, she just has this, what, what do my notes over here say? Um, she's got this, this mixture of quiet anguish with a, you know, combined with a deep understanding through faith um, that this had to be, that this was his destiny. Um, her drapery, um, you know, is lovingly done. The drapery folds in all of her uh, garments and everything. And it's just a super quiet moment. This is a classic triangular composition. The uh, Italian Renaissance was famous for doing very quiet, balanced, and often triangular compositions, especially when dealing with um, different Im issues, images of Mary. So it's, it's just really interesting to see this in terms of um, Michelangelo's early output. I cannot, again, imagine sculpting this at the age of 20 his genius is just, you know, it, it's towering and amazing. And the rest of us, you know, we have to do our own thing and can't worry that, you know, nobody's ever going to be as good as Michelangelo, although you might be and it might be wonderful. Um, here's, here's a different sculpture. Um, Michelangelo was um, commissioned to carve a tomb um, inside of a cathedral for Pope Julius II. And Julius II was the Pope that commissioned Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling and, you know, arrange for other commissions for him for the church and whatnot. And this, um, this tomb had several large sculptures in it. And this image of Moses is only one of them, but it's, it's a fantastic uh, sculpture. 
Again, it's biblical. You probably are detecting a theme here, and it's not my fault. You know, the church was a major um, uh, arts uh, commissioning agent um, in the uh, Middle Ages and in the Italian Renaissance. And so, you know, the major works of Western civilization during that time usually had a biblical theme going for them. And so this is no different. This is Moses, um, you know, and he's one of the prophets from the Old Testament. And he is the lawgiver. He's the one who receives the Ten Commandments from God on top of Mount Sinai to give to the um, the Israel, Israelites that have been um, freed from their bondage in Egypt. And so here we have uh, Moses just receiving the Ten Commandments. You can see the tablets of the Ten Commandments tucked underneath his right arm. It's on the left side there, those two square things. And he is just turning now because God has told him or he has just realized that the Israelites are sinning down below in their encampment at the base of Mount Sinai. And that while he's been up there for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, as a prophet receiving the word of God, um, the Israelites have turned to, um, you know, creating other gods made out of gold, like calf, uh, like a calf or some other kind of Egyptian style God. And they're, you know, worshiping false gods. And of course, one of the Ten Commandments is, you know, don't worship a false god. So anyway, um, we see Moses turning and the rage in him is just beginning. Now, one of the things I want to talk about, about this sculpture is that Moses is an old man by now. You know, he's, um, he's, he's uh, been leading the Israelites, you know, out of Egypt and he's a prophet. And so his wisdom is depicted by his long flowing beard and everything. And yet even through his age, um, uh, the story goes that he stayed vital as a young man. He had the arms and legs um, of youth and vitality. And so you can see, we're going to be able to see that in his face in a moment. But right now we want to see his arms, especially the bent arm that's resting with a hand in his lap and his legs that are kind of bent underneath him as he's turning in the chair. And you can just see the musculature, the muscular tension um, carved into the, um, the uh, marble there for us. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of stuff here. Okay, um, so here's Moses turning uh, with his rage. The smoothness of the skin in his face, you know, shows that concept of youth combined with the really, really long flowing beard, which is supposed to show age and wisdom and all of that. The two horns sticking out of his head are a really interesting convention. Um, this convention had been used by artists and especially sculptors in sculpting images of Moses since the Middle Ages. So it had been in use for a couple of hundred years. And really, it was a mistranslation of the Old Testament, of the story of the Exodus, you know, um, from the Greek into the Vulgate, into the Latin text. And the mistranslation was that Moses, you know, had these horns emanating from his head. And so artists tend to use those little horns, you know, um, um, like little goat horns um, to kind of help to depict Moses. And so that people who um, were illiterate and weren't reading these texts themselves could recognize, oh yeah, that's Moses because he's got horns up on top. But really the, the real translation was that he had light, rays of light emanating from his head because he had been in the presence of God. And so, you know, he had the, the light rays coming out. So it's really interesting to see the mistranslation, um, the convention of that being even repeated by Michelangelo in this sculpture. That's a little aside, a little ha 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 for you guys. Okay, we're gonna move on to the Baroque and to um, the, the sculptor, the 17th sculpture, Bernini, sculpting at least a hundred years after Michelangelo. Um, Bernini's uh, David here, again, the, here's the theme completed now for us. Um, David is in an action pose. He's in the middle of combat right now. 
So we have to remember that the Italian Baroque period is classified as art that really likes to explore drama and emotion and action. And so the quiet, the relative quiet <coughs> and contemplation of Renaissance sculpture gives way to much more active movements. We've got diagonals happening in this sculpture. This is definitely a contrapposto sculpture where you've got um, the, the sculptural form, the torso is twisting and bending, but we've got diagonals of arms twisting and bending in different directions and the legs are going in different directions as David is striding and moving towards uh, launching the stone with his sling. He's got the sling kind of um, between his two hands, his front hand has the sling with the rock in the pocket of the sling and his rear hand that's further back has the other end of the sling that you, you keep um, hold of while you're, while you're uh, swinging the sling around to launch the stone. And so we can see the determination, the tension in David's mouth as he's pulling his lips tight and he's got his furrowed you know, brow again and his fixed gaze on Goliath and of course the tousled hair and everything else of the young shepherd boy. But we definitely have an adult uh, again, but he's also in the act of combat now. He's not contemplating it or thinking about it or poised to do combat. He is now engaged in, in the combat uh, against Goliath in this, in this particular sculpture. Um, I wanted to just depart from you know David for a little bit to look at other sculptures, especially the Ecstasy of Saint Ter Teresa. This is another Bernini sculpture from the Baroque, and you know this is a, an amazing sculpture. Now Saint Teresa um, was known to have ecstatic visions where. Um, if she described them, it felt like there was an angel standing over her, thrusting a, an arrow in and out of her heart over and over again. And yes, you know, the Freudians among us would think of all kinds of sexual connotations about that. And whether the ecstasy that she was feeling was an emotional one or an intellectual one or a spiritual one, it probably was not a sexual ecstasy. And yet with her head pushed back and her lips parted and her eyes closed, an ecstasy is an ecstasy. And so we see all of the rumpling of the garments of her um, drapery uh, in, her, in her garment. We can see just her ankles uh, or where her feet are visible and her hands are visible, um, kind of twisting and writhing in this ecstatic vision that she's having. Um, Bernini did this installation um, in the cathedral with the, the gilded bronze um, rays of, um, you know, divine energy in the background. So those, those um, golden, um, like, streaks of light that are um, hung on the back wall behind the sculpture is actually supposed to be part of the sculpture, even though most of the sculpture is carved marble. The arrow that is being held in the outstretched arm of the, um, uh, the angel is also cast bronze too, and it's gilded. So, and it, that arrow is pointed directly at her heart. And it, as a matter of fact, you can see that the angel is lifting up her uh, garment to expose her chest so that he can plunge the arrow into her chest. I'm going to stop for just a second and come back to you guys to see if you're still here or if I missed and I've lost anybody. So I'm sorry that this is like um, drinking from the fire hose, but this is, you know, just a little bit of art history sculptures to kind of give you a sense of where we stand on the shoulders of giants when it comes to studying the human figure. This is why we are so interested in the human figure because it has a profound place in um, art history for the, for the Western civilization and for, um, for the um, development of artists too. Um, so at an, at an art school in an art department, 
um, we do figure study. We either do life drawing or figure sculpture so that artists and art students can learn the basics of the forms and proportions of the human figure. I don't expect any of you guys to sculpt like this. I want you to be inspired by this stuff, okay? So don't freak out. We're gonna go right back to it now and keep going. I'll try to go a little bit faster. Okay, so, um, so trying to get through this. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead to the late 19th century because we'd like to do something that transitions from the 19th into the 20th century, transitioning from traditional art into modern art, but still staying fairly um, figurative, fairly representational and naturalistic in the figure. So this is a, the first sculpture, the breakout sculpture by Auguste Rodin, uh, a French sculptor, um, working in and around Paris in the latter half, especially the latter third of the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century. So um, this piece was uh, cast in bronze, but a lot of people, a lot of, um, a lot of art critics and the public were scandalized by it. They thought that he, he must have obviously um, done a life cast of some model or something and then cast the sculpture from a life casting of an actual person. Um, this has too much fluidity, too much movement. The proportions are too nice and too perfect. This could not have been a sculpture that Rodin actually sculpted with a figure um, uh, model modeling for him. So that was the, um, that was the, uh, the scandal that was all surrounding this first sculpture that Rodin exhibited. And this helped to make his and solidify um, his reputation as a fantastic sculptor in France at the end of the 19th century. Um, many of Rodin's sculptures are almost um, artistic um, cliches uh, coming down to us today. Now, especially when I was growing up in the 1970s, I saw the thinker and the kiss all over the place. These were such cliches in art and in popular culture that they were being made fun of, you know, on television and in cartoons and everything. So this is the thinker. Uh, it's famous and hopefully maybe you've seen some version of this before. This is a, a nude male figure, heroic in scale, kind of sitting um, on a rock with his hand um, underneath his chin, lost deeply in thought, contemplation, and reflection. And this was actually, um, you know, supposed to be one of the figures in Rodin's The Gates of Hell, which we're going to see in a minute. Um, and in fact, this was supposed to represent the poet Dante, um, whose epic poem, um, The Inferno, um, kind of describes uh, the different levels of hell and all of those people who are suffering the torments of hell um, because of what they did in life. Uh, again, it's got lots of Christian religious overtones and that kind of stuff, and we'll get to that in a little while. Um, you can see just a powerful, the power of the um, sculptor's hand in this. Um, the musculature is just a slightly tiny bit exaggerated in places in a way that just makes it um, ripple with vitality um, and just feel like it's imbued with life of one kind or another, even though it is in kind of a, um, an enclosed and quiet um, and still um, uh, pose, it feels like it can move and then it can get up and, and um, you know, walk around and be animated. It, it's animated with life. Um, Rodin's kiss is another one of those uh, images that has been so copied that it's also a cliche in art today. The, the most famous kiss is the one on the left. Um, it's kind of like the enclosed kiss. It was the original kiss. It was also something that made its way into the gates of hell, which we will look at very soon, I promise you. Um, but, you know, because it's kind of an enclosed sculpture where the two figures are embracing each other completely, 
um, you know, it again is very quiet, like the thinker. And also because of that, it was much more um, able to be shown in various angles to the general public in images that weren't something that had to be censored, you know, even, you know, during most of the 20th century. So there's that. I'm very interested in the kiss on the right hand side that's much more um, expressive and owes a lot more to ballet dance than um, the, the sculpture on the left side. Um, it's also known as the kiss. Um, uh, Rodin executed several different versions of the, the concept of the kiss, the idea of male and female coming together. Uh, the kiss being this expression of love, but also an expression of beauty, an expression of um, trying to um, become one um, together. Um, I want to say that, you know, as we do our own um, figure sculpture here with the nude, we're going to be dealing with the sensuality of the figure. It's not going to be sexual in nature. We need to be able to make that distinction as um, as artists and as students of art. And I'll continue to remind us of that while we're looking at this. This is the gates of hell. Um, this was a huge commission. Um, artists, especially sculptors, ever since the Middle Ages have been really, really interested in the idea of doing a set of bronze doors for a major architectural um, uh, building of some kind. Um, Stor stories of bronze doors go all the way back to uh, ancient Rome. And so the idea of doing um, a, a set of bronze doors is one of the um, um, bucket list things that most artists had you know, on their list of things to do. And so um, uh, this was originally commissioned for a museum of decorative arts that actually uh, was canceled and never built. But Rodin was so far into the project that he just kept going with it, um, creating lots and lots of imagery from this, and then spinning a lot of that imagery out into individual single kinds of sculptures that he was able to market and sell throughout his career. And so we're gonna to have to go into this gates of hell to see that the thinker is up here in the upper register in the center portion, just above the doors. And so the thinker is supposed to be Dante um, who wrote the epic poem. He may also symbolize um, just humanity itself contemplating its own fate contemplating its own flaws and the fallacies you know, involved in being human. Um, humans are able to experience all kinds of you know, fantastic, um, well, experiences in life, um, passion, joy, um, heartbreak, sorrow, um, you know, all the huge, huge wide range of emotion. And so a lot of the, that emotional content and emotional writhing, then that suffering of humanity is a kind of thing that's depicted in these gates of hell. Now, unlike all kinds of other gates that were done in the Middle Ages, I'm sorry, doors, bronze doors in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance, this one is characterized by how much the uh, figures and different scenes and everything are kind of all woven together and moved together, that there are different figures that are hanging and dangling and breaking through from one frame into a next. Um, all of the previous doors were all kind of inside of their own frames. And so all of the different kinds of imagery and stories, narratives that they were trying to tell were nicely contained within frames. This one is a wild, hot mess of people um, doing all kinds of passionate suffering and dying and, you know, um, over and over again in hell. It's just wonderful. It's a fantastic thing. Um, but I digress. One of the, another figure that's found in the gates of hell is this inner voice, also known as meditation. Um, I believe that the inner voice is the one with the arms on the left, while meditation is the version without arms. It's kind of, you know, its arms have not been put on. And it's really interesting. Um, the meditation was something that upset a lot of uh, uh, critics in the late 19th century, because they weren't ready to have an unfinished sculpture put on view and displayed as if it was a finished sculpture. 
In the armless version on the right-hand side, you can still see some of the seams that were from the casting process, from the actual mold making process. Um, so some of the casting process, the seams and things have not been chased away, have not been ground and um, polished and made to disappear. So between that and this kind of modern approach to um, ancient ruins, the idea of knocking the arms off of the sculpture, which is the way that we find a lot of ancient ruined sculpture when a um, you know, marauding, vandalizing, um, invading horde comes in and attacks a city and destroys you know, the sculpture. Um, that's the way that we find a lot of the ancient uh, Greek um, temples uh, have a lot of sculptures that had the arms and noses and stuff knocked off of them because of the ravages of time. So here's a ready-made, here's a pre-made kind of a, um, um, a, a, an ancient ruin. It's a modern ruin. And, you know, it, it's kind of really interesting to pull some of the threads of art history and, in fact, ancient art history into this and push it forward as a modern uh, interpretation and kind of a modern abstraction of the, the full figure sculpture that, as it was originally um, uh, envisioned on the left hand side. Um, I, I, I love this piece. This is an in, uh, a very, very extreme contrapposto sculpture. Once again, all of the weight is borne on one leg, while no weight or almost no weight is borne on the other leg, which creates this very uh, big change in what's happening and an S curve that runs through the center of the torso of the person. It's just, it's amazing sculpture. Um, the I Am Beautiful sculpture is again, uh, it's from the Gates of Hell, and it's also uh, uh, combining, it's kind of an, an assemblage of two sculptures. Crouching Woman is the female figure that's being hoisted up in the arms, and the arms are of um, a sculpture that was either known as uh, Uglino, uh, Ugliano, um, or The Falling Man. So the falling man was a man was a male figure sculpture that had open arms and the open arms were just kind of open um, in an open gesture in front of him. And then it was redone to make that sculpture embrace um, the crouching woman sculpture. And then the two of them together are like this impossible embrace of lovers that can't really um, ever consummate their love. Uh, or their passion for each other. So it's, it's really interesting. It's a very sensual sculpture. And at the same time, it's, it's about a lot more than just sexuality. It's about unrequited love. Um, it's, about, it's about all kinds of other deeper kinds of passion than the superficial. It's a lovely sculpture. And it's one of my favorite sculptures. But my favorite sculpture, and this is the last one, this is where you guys get to breathe a sigh of relief and go home, is the Danaid. Um, this sculpture also appears uh, as a piece in the Gates of Hell, but this is my absolute favorite Rodin sculpture. Um, he's adapting a mythological theme here, and I'm reading this right off of the text box. The Daughters of Danaos, or the Danaids, as they were called. Um, were made to fill up a bottomless barrel with water as a punishment for killing uh, their husbands on their wedding night. Um, so, you know, she has been kind of condemned to a hellish, um, unending existence. And this was, this is pre-Christian. I mean, this goes back to Greek mythology, but this is, again, um, the idea of an eternal damnation and eternal punishment for something. And so she's reaching down into the hole to try to draw out some water to fill the bucket. And most of the time, uh, the Danaids are depicted standing up with a jug of water or a bucket of water trying to fill this barrel that's leaking out the other side. But here we see her crouching down and reaching far down into the ground trying to reach the water and she's taken just a brief moment to rest and so the side of her face is 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 shown to us in kind of the the torment and agony and also just taking a brief rest of this unending agony of filling this bucket 
And what's just beautiful to me and poetic is the back muscles and the, mu and the um, anatomy of the shoulders, the process of the spine, the hips, um, everything, even down to the glutes. Just it, the beauty of the back is what is celebrated in this sculpture. And it is absolutely stunning. Um, it's amazing sculpture. I love it quite a bit. And I'm always uh, reminded of this when I'm trying to sculpt so that I don't, um, uh, so that I don't ignore the back if I'm sculpting a sculpture in the round and I'm dealing with the front, which has all the fun parts on it. It's got the face and the breast forms and um, the pubic area and the um, abs and tummy and everything else is on the front and everybody always ignores the back of the sculpture. And this is my admonition to you guys to remember to don't ignore the back because the back has so much wonderful form going on that we do need to bring some attention to, to um, finishing and, and uh, paying attention to um, the, the uh, musculature and anatomy of the back of the sculpture. Okay, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm coming back to you guys. I'm gonna stop the screen share at this point. I didn't lose too many of you in all of this. I'm gonna ask you guys if you have any questions or comments about this. Um, this was trying to cover the middle ages to the beginning of the modern age today. We still have one more death by PowerPoint for Thursday, where I wanted to try to do some of the 20th and 21st century sculptors that I think were interesting, especially those that deal with the human form, and especially a naturalistic representational human form. So I wanna look at some of those sculptors um, on Thursday. But if you have any questions or comments, um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, there's only my dumb answers. And I'm happy to try to either uh, come up with an answer for you or to research and find an answer for you that I can give you next time. But do any of you guys have any questions at this point or just a comment or something that you wanna make? I've been talking for a good hour. So I'm gonna wrap this up real soon. And this did record successfully. So I will post this recording um, in e-learning at my Laker link so that you guys can find this and go through it again. You can skip through the boring parts or you can look at the really cool stuff at your leisure. So there's that. So I'm looking at the participants list to see if anybody wanted to make a comment. Here comes Aurora. Um, I was just checking and it looks like we're gonna be an extreme risk category this coming week. Yay. Can you hear me? Oh God. Oh, um, and yeah. so I was just curious, like, are we still going to be trying to get started on our sculptures or what yeah. is that going to look like if we do stay in the extremist category? Well, that's an interesting thing. And see, we are playing Calvin ball here. So schools can go by a slightly different set of rules than the rest of the county or the rest of the state. So because you guys have been doing such a good job of quarantining for two weeks, um, you're supposed to be in the clear and we're supposed to be able to get together on Tuesday. Now that doesn't mean that the college in its wisdom couldn't yank that out from underneath of us. And then I'll have to come up with a plan B. And plan B would be me shoveling 50 pound bags of clay out the door so that you guys could pick up clay and boards and then somehow providing you with a nude representation of a figure so that you could do a sculpture and that we could do it together. I am not authorized to have a live nude model here with me. I'm not authorized to put out um, imagery of a nude model that is from this area. So I would have to go to like a website where I could get like Art Model 360, where I could buy a subscription and then put up um, different images taken in the round of a model in a particular pose that we could sculpt, something like that. 
I hate to want to even go there, but I thought I would at least let you know that there is a plan B and possibly a plan C if we're not allowed to get together. But I am in the process of building sneeze guards for all of the workstations in the Eden 3 studio so that you guys are going to be separated by plastic, clear plastic sheets of uh, material so that you guys aren't breathing on each other. You guys will all be at least 10 feet away from the model who will be in the center of the room. I will have, and we will all be wearing uh, masks so that we will all be trying to keep our germs to ourselves as well as not you know, breathing each other's germs. The model, even if they are nude, they will be wearing a mask too. So I, you know, I am hopeful that with all of the precautions that we can take, all of the exceptions that we may be granted because we are an educational institution and not just another bar or restaurant in Coos County, that we will be able to proceed next week. So I haven't interviewed the models yet. I haven't hired a model yet. And so when I do that on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, I will find out whether we're going to be allowed to go forward with a live model in Eden 3 starting next Tuesday. Stay tuned, okay? Thank you for that question. It was earth shattering. And I'm sorry that I can't give you anything more substantial than that. But that's my understanding of it at this time. Let's I just have a follow-up question. Oh, you do? Okay. I also yeah. see that there's some stuff in the chat too, so I'm going to look. Okay, what's your question? Um, so since you will be wearing a model, or they'll be wearing a model, uh, or a mask, sorry, it's yeah. been a long day. Since they're going to be in a mask, um, if we want to do like facial structures or anything like that, can we kind of just attempt at a relatively what we think might be under the mask? Face yes. Or, okay, yes. Cool. Absolutely. That's my last question. Thank you. That, that's cool. That's a good question. Um, for those of us who are beginners, um, we're probably just going to keep the faces kind of just blank as a an oval part of the head form, because everybody else who's never done art before and who's not an art major will be just will have all that they can do to just do the forms and proportions of a human figure and get general proportions done. But you guys who are art majors and wanna give it a shot, you're welcome to put facial features on there and try to make your own version, your own interpretation of the pose and uh, this model's face. So that will be fine. I think I, I gotta wrap it up because I'm over an hour now. And so this makes for a really long recording. I will see you guys again on Thursday afternoon at one o'clock. Until then, keep the faith, and I'll see you again on Thursday. Goodbye for now.